Hello, and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. This is our series, 10 Questions We Have Reached the Greeks, Greek Geography and Culture. So our first question is, what two aspects were the most important to Greek geography? And those are the mountains and the sea. Greece is a peninsula. It's surrounded by water on three sides. It's also very, very mountainous. This is our first kind of uh, mountain people as opposed to river valley people that we're talking about. And so our second question then has to be, what effects do those aspects have? I'm, what are the effects of ge Greek geography? And the mountains equaled isolation, poverty, independence. 90% of the land is useless for farming in a world that 95% of the economy is farming. Isolation. You can't go across those mountains. You can't go and trade. You can't go and make a, make a weekend visit. And so you get poverty, isolation, but you also get independence. The people who live in the valley are going to be independent of all the people around them because it's too hard for them to come over the mountains beat you up and tell you what to do. In Egypt, it was easy. The cataract to the delta. Everybody got told what to do by the pharaoh. Why? Because in the beginning of the old kingdom, a pharaoh beat up all the other people who thought they should be in charge, and there was nothing geographic to stop that pharaoh. Only the cataract and the sea and the deserts. And so you got Egypt. Mesopotamia is the same from the Persian Gulf all the way to the Tarsus Mountains, to the Hittite Mountains in the north. You could conquer the whole thing. There was nothing geographically stopping you. And so we see Sargon and we see the Assyrians and we see Hammurabi do so. The mountains of Greece made conquering Greece very difficult, especially for poor, little poor cities. It's too hard to own. It's too hard to control. Well, what about the sea? Well, what the sea created was trade, colonization, and wealth. If the mountains made you poor, then you had to go to other places to get the stuff you need. That's trade. Well, if you can't go by land because of the mountains, you can go by sea. So Greece is identified with the sea. In Xenophon, it's Thalassa, Thalassa. The Xenophon's army has invaded, uh, we talked about this with the Persians, has invaded the Persian Empire, has gone all the way down to Babylon. It's the middle of a desert. It's the middle of this arid land. It's the middle of nowhere for the Greeks. But there's a famous scene when they have crossed the Tarsus Mountains. They are crossing Asia Minor, and they hit water, ocean. Not a lake, not a river. They hit ocean, and the cry out as the men see it, and they're running towards the sea is Talassa, Talassa, T-H-L-A-S-S-A. -S -S the sea, the sea, meaning we're home. We still have a long journey to go. But now that we are at the ocean, we can get home. All we have to do is find a port. All we have to do is find boats, and we can get home. Talassa, Talassa. So trade, but also colonization. Remember, Greece is poor, so it can't support that many people. So if you're a young person, you know, young man or woman who wants to make it in the world, wants to get rich, wants to carve something out, looks at all the old folk who own all the land and says, I want my own farm, I want my own place, I want my own city, I want to run myself, I want my, I want my own independence, then you could get on a boat and go places. Anywhere touched by sea, and the Greeks will go. There are Greek colonies in the coast, what's called Ionia, the coast of Asia Minor, the Crimea up in what is today Ukraine, Russia, is uh, also colonized by the Greeks. The entire Black Sea coast is colonized by the Greeks. Uh, but maybe most importantly was what was called Magna Gracia, Greater Greece. So Southern Italy and Sicily were so Greek that they're not Italian. So for those of you who are, who are 
proudly Southern Italians. Your ancestors were Greek long before they were Italian. They were made Italian by the Romans. But you could leave Greece and go to Southern France, to Eastern Spain, to North Africa, set up a city, set up a colony, be tied back home, trade, because you had more land, more area, you could have wealth. The sea was wealth. So the Greeks don't stay in Greece. It's better in Sicily. It's better in southern Italy, in Ionia, which is the coast of Turkey today, Asia Minor, and the Black Sea. The Greeks don't stay. So like the Phoenicians, they leave. They go places. They expand. This is the opposite of the Egyptians, who want to stay in Egypt. What effect did geography have on Greek civilization? Well, it had a military effect, interestingly enough, though that's what we're kind of talking about. It made the polis, the city, into the identity. You weren't Greek. You spoke Greek. You worshipped Greek gods. But you weren't Greek. You were Athenian. You were Spartan. You were Corinthian. That was your identity. You identified with your local city not with a bigger idea of Helene, H-E-L-L-E-N, of a Greek. And you, we should understand, the Greeks didn't call themselves Greeks. That's a Roman name. The Greeks called themselves Hellenes, which is Helen, Helen of Troy, right? Helen who's stolen away. The, the whole idea of, in Homer is that Helen, which is Greece, is stolen by Asia, which is the Trojans. And so the Greeks, the Hellenes, have to go and get back Helen. They have to go save Europe. But they didn't see themselves as these other things. They saw themselves as the city that they were a part of. Their society was too poor to have an army, to have a professional army. It's too mountainous to have chariots. So the army that the Greeks will create is a phalanx. So what is a phalanx? Well, if you're watching the video, you can see it's a box of ordinary people, farmers, standing shoulder to shoulder, carrying a spear and a shield. The shield, which was to protect the person to your left, not yourself. So you carry, it's a ordinary people standing shoulder to shoulder in a box carrying a spear, a shield to protect the person to your left, and wearing bronze armor. So did the phalanx matter? Why did it matter? And it mattered because for the first time, farmers, ordinary farmers, were able to fight and survive a battle. Ordinary farmers can't fight professional soldiers. For ordinary farmers could not fight chariots. We, we've seen this for 2,000 years. Chariot armies go and roll through farmers. Professional armies like the Assyrians just obliterate the amateur uh, conscripts of farmers. For the first time, by sandwiching together in this box, you were safe. You were covered in armor. You had a helmet that covered your face. You had no ear holes because there's no uh, orders that can be given, right? You're squeezed in. You got a guy behind you, a guy in front of you. There's, you cannot turn to the left or to the right. You cannot go backwards. You can only go forwards. And so your shield covered the man next to you, to your left. And the reason it covered the man next to you was because a phalanx battle is going to last 20 to 30 minutes. If you held a shield in your hand, your wrist is too weak to hold the shield. The shield was made of inch-thick oak wood covered with metal. So it weighed 15 to 20 pounds. So if you want to know what it's like, go to the gym, get a dumbbell of like 18 and a half pounds, and hold it out in front of you. I'll give you 30 seconds to a minute before your wrist gets tired and you start lowering that, whether you want to or not. Well, the Greeks knew this, and so what they did was move the, the grips to the left, 
which allowed you to put your arm through it so that now the grips were on your your bicep. They were above your elbow or, or on your forearm and your bicep. It, it meant the weight was now on your shoulder. And 18 pounds, 20 pounds on your shoulder, on the other hand, you could do all day. You know, do shoulder presses. 20-pound shoulder presses, you could do all day. So the idea was that moved the shield to the left, but that protected the person next to you. So what the Greeks also did was put people who loved each other next to each other, fathers and sons, brothers, cousins. And in the Spartans and the uh, Theban traditions, homosexual lovers, because the idea was these men are not going to leave each other. And as long as that phalanx stays together, as long as it doesn't break apart and run, most people in it were pretty safe. And so by putting fathers and sons together, by putting brothers next to each other, by putting homosexual lovers next to each other, what it was doing was putting glue into the phalanx so that people wouldn't want to run away. So how did they fight? Being that these guys are amateurs, how did they fight? Well, they fought like a car crash. You could only move in one direction, so they lined up against each other, and they ran into each other. The spears hitting shields, then bending and then breaking. People shield the shield. Uh, little knives coming out, trying to stab people in the eyes, the mouth, and the, not, and the neck, right? It's a 20 minutes, the guys behind you putting their shield in your back, pushing you. And what happened is those two boxes became inter, inter, intermerged. They became melded. Those front lines, those front three lines of each of those boxes, and if you, if you look at the video, I have a, a little diagram of this. It's not a GIF, but it's just a diagram. They become inter interconnected. And what happens is you're no longer fighting with the man next to you. The man next to you has been separated by, by two of the enemy. And so what happens is people panic and they run. And they start to, to the sides blow out. They go, they, people die. Um, the sides aren't protected, so they run away. Um, and the phalanx just kind of implodes and runs. There's not mass death. This is not the Assyrians. In fact, once that phalanx runs, you're carrying 60 pounds of armor, 20 pounds in a shield. You might still have your 10-foot-long spear. You are useless as an independent soldier. And so what the Greek phalanx does that wins well, is laugh. Ho, 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 kind of like Jabba the Hutt. Laughs. And then they erect a trophy. Trophy means turning point. It means this is the place where these guys ran. You'd, you'd describe, you know, the Thebans ran here, right? You'd laugh and then sit down and have a drink. Diplomats would show up from the losing side, negotiate terms of a peace, because whatever you were fighting for over the mountain, over the, the, the mine that was between you two, over the fishing, uh, the fishing, uh, I don't know, inlet that you were fighting over you negotiated a piece of like five years they're able to pick up their dead because that's what you're negotiating for you're negotiating for we get the mine and you get your dead back we have them here we have them we, we picked them up we put it we stacked them up you could have their bodies back no problem uh you could bury them give them rights give them funerals we didn't desecrate the bodies. They're all yours. We just want that mine that's in the mountain between us. Yes, great. Take your bodies back. We get the mine. Five years. We'll see in five. We'll see in six years when we fight. If there's still stuff in the mine, if there's still gold in the mine, we'll fight it over again. See, the Greeks knew you were never going to have peace forever. So they made, made peace treaties with terms in it, with lengths. Now, these were religious pieces. These were pieces that everyone swore on the gods, and so it was a big deal. You didn't want to break it because then you're breaking not only, you know, is there, you're breaking a vow. You're not only breaking your word to the other people, 
the other side, which tells everybody your treaties don't mean anything, but you're also telling the gods that you use them as liars. The gods aren't, you know, you still need the gods. So warfare was a quick one afternoon way of ending disputes. Yeah, you've got your farmers together. They formed the phalanx of about 300 men. They slammed into each other. One side ran away. You negotiated a peace. Boom, it took about uh, 20 minutes for the battle, an hour, hour and a half for the negotiations. Done. You know, yeah, yeah, it's done in an afternoon. The mountains meant there were no empires. Extended warfare was just too expensive for these poor cities. So you did one big battle and it was over and you settled your fight. You got it out. You know. So what was the important cultural result of the phalanx? Well, the answer is citizenship. Why? Well, poverty meant that they couldn't pay people to fight. So how do you get Greek farmers to fight if you can't pay them? How do you get anybody to fight? You have to give them something. And the thing Greek poli, Greek cities could give, was citizenship. You belong to us. You're one of us. A mutual connection between the city and the people. You go, well, okay, what does that mean? It means you have rights. As an Athenian, you have Athenian rights. As Spartan, you have Spartan rights. You have rights within Sparta. And the biggest of the rights is a say in the government decisions. If you're going to be in the military and you're going to risk your life for the government, you want to have a say in the government. We see this in the United States. African Americans, freedmen, got the right to vote after the Civil War. Why? Because they had fought 100 to 200,000 uh, free men, ex-slaves, had fought for the Union, for the victory in the Civil War. Nobody thought they shouldn't have the right to vote. I mean, the I mean, the racists thought that, but even even the racists who were like, "Well, you know, uh, I don't like these people, but they did fight for." And so they wanted. There was an argument. Well, we'll just limit African Americans who who served in the army. They have the right to vote. And that was unworkable, so it became all African-American men have the right to vote. Women got excluded, and it's the first, um, the 14th Amendment is the first amendment that actually excludes women from it, from enjoying the rights, specifically stops women from enjoying the rights. It says African-American men can vote. Well, that goes back through the Romans to the Greeks, is that if you served in the army, you do your responsibilities to the state, you can have a say in the government. You've earned the right. You have to join the army. You have to follow the laws. And that's true today. I had a roommate in graduate school. He was Jamaican, and he was an American citizen. How did he become an American citizen? He became an American citizen in five, six years. How? How? because he served in the Navy. He served in the Navy, 30%, you may not know this, but 30% of the American army, American military is actually uh, non-citizens. We'll talk about this more when we hit the Roman Empire. He served, and one of the deals was, if you serve and you do it honorably, you follow the laws, then you get fast-tracked for citizenship. So he got a citizenship, which meant when he married a woman who is not an American, who is Haitian, she got fast-tracked for citizenship. And their kids were automatically citizens. Both because their father was an American citizen, but also because they would be born in the United States. So you get rights in exchange for responsibilities. And the biggest right is a say in government decisions if you join the army. The result of this is a government of what's called an oligarchy. The few with an assembly. Now the oligarchy is usually the rich guys, the super rich guys. 10, 15. Those who have a tradition of running the show, those who know how to run the show, 
those who have the money to run the show. But what's due is the assembly. Now, this is not a democracy because in a democracy, the assembly runs itself. It doesn't need that oligarchy. But it, in this case, the oligarchy is running the show, but it goes to the assembly and says, we have a big decision to make. We have to go fight the Athenians. What do you say? Do you say yes or no? Uh, we have to raise taxes. Yes or no. Uh, we want to send a colony to Sicily. Yes or no. So the oligarchy is the government, but every once in a and it's and it's and it's generational. It's these rich guys who are used to that power. But now they have to uh, major decisions turn to a group of men who had served in the army who are citizens and say, "What say you?" This is not a democracy, but it is representational government. Added to this is autonomia, because every city with its own phalanx army is going to have its own rules. It's going to have its own laws. And so independence to make your own laws and in your own city without having to ask anybody else permission was autonomia, where we get autonomy from. Auto. A-U-T-O, nomia, N-O-M-I-A, where we get autonomy, which we take as independence. But they meant it as independence to make your own laws. You didn't have to ask Athens what your laws were going to be. You didn't have to get approval from Sparta if you wanted to change your rules. You just got the assembly together. The oligarchs came out, said, we have a proposal. We'd like to do this, yes or no. It's like a referendum today in state levels. Well, how about the women? How do women fare in the Greek polis? What's their status in the Greek polis? Well, they can't join the army because they can't carry the heavy weight of the armor and the shield. So since they can't join the army, they're not citizens. So since they're not citizens, what are they? Well, we know what they are. They're treated like they are in Hammurabi's code. As children, they are given a protected status, but they are not part of the demos. They are not part of the group. They are not part of the citizen citizenry, which means the men make rules that women have to follow. Which, if you've just watched anything in the news concerning women's health and women's reproductive health, you know always ends up stupid. Because what do men know about women? Uh, nothing. And to be fair to the Greeks, they knew that. They knew men did not know anything about women. And so men and women actually lived fairly separately. They didn't really live in the same world. Women did women's stuff. Men did men's stuff. And they only came together to kind of like have dinner and make babies. Like they didn't really hang out together. They lived in separate worlds. We see this today in, in conservative uh, societies, like Islamic societies, like Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, where you go to a public, you go and see, uh, you go to a sports bar. The, the bar won't be serving alcohol in Saudi Arabia or the Emirates, but you go to a sports bar, right? You go to watch, you know, Arsenal versus Man United, right? There are no men, there are no women there. It's all men. It's a men zone. It's a men male space. There are no women there. Meanwhile, female spaces have no men in them. So, women's status in the Greek polis is not as citizens. They are not citizens, so they are treated as children, which means they get protected status. And they are, but they are not part of the political class. There's a play called Lysistrata. We'll mention it later. It's an anti-war play by Euripides. It's written in 415 after the army, the Athenian army in Sicily is destroyed almost to a man. And so it's a trauma play. It's a, tr it's a, it's a play about horror happening to the populace of Athens. And what happens is the women decide they are not going to 
allow the war to f- go on anymore. They have to stop the war. We, the w- women are their mothers, their wives, their sisters, or their fiancés. They are all affected by this. And so what they do is have a sex strike. What they do is basically say to each other, we are no longer going to have sex with our husbands, our men, until they stop the war. And they realize the problem. They have to get the Spartan women to do the same. They have to get the other women in the war to do the same. All the women of Greece are going to have to stop having sex with their husbands in order for the men to stop the war. And the comedy is twofold, because it is a comedy. It is twofold. One is the men are not, they spend the three acts, four acts of the play, not sure which one they're going to choose. The men are not completely sold on the, like, maybe we could just do war. Maybe, maybe the, the, the sex part is, like, something we could go without. Maybe? What do you think? The second part is, is that in the Greek world, in the Greek mindset, women desired sex more than men. Women wanted sex more because they wanted to have children. They were lustier. They were more earthly. They were more emotional, whereas men were more higher, were intellectual, spiritual, right? And so they were supposed to be above sex. You know, sex is, is this dirty thing. It's this thing animals do. But thinking, building pyramids is what men do. Philosophy is what men do. Poetry, right? Writing the gospels is what men do, right? But sex is what animals do. And you can't write a gospel. You can't build a pyramid if you're having sex. And so in the Greek mindset, sex was a necessary but animalistic thing that you did. And so women wanted it more than men. This is very different than the world we live in, the Victorian world, where it's women are are keeping men in check. It's men who want sex and women who keep them from having it. In the Greek world, it's the opposite. And so the comedy is that when this is first proposed by Lysistrata, the women are like, yeah, no, no, this is the one thing I get out of my husband. I'm going to now give that up. What? Like, come on. I don't, I'm not married to him for the conversation. Like Lizzie, what are you doing? Come on. And if you want a very good representation of this from an African-American perspective, watch Chirac, uh, Spike Lee's movie about gang violence in Chicago. It's, it, it takes Lysa Strada and just moves it to 2010 or wherever Chicago with gang violence and gun violence. And it's exactly, and this, there's a funny, very funny scene where Lysa Strada, they keep the names, says, we're going to have a sex strike. And the other women are like, girlfriend, please. That's not serious. So there's the comedy that the women want to have the sex more than the men do. And the second part is that the men aren't sure which they would rather have, war or sex. But what this shows is that how hard it is for women's politics to be taken seriously. For them to exert greater political power, they have to strike. They have to deny men a privilege. They have to deny men a pleasure. They have to they have to work together in order just to have men stop murdering each other in the fields and the seas of Greece. And so women have power. Lysistrata is very clear as a play. Women have power if they work together. And men who don't realize women have power are going to live to regret that. But it also shows it takes three hours for this to happen that they're not always taken seriously, that their concerns are not always taken seriously, and their politics are not taken seriously. They have to be, men have to be made to take women seriously. All right. That brings us to Greek culture. Great. So what did Homer's Iliad teach men? Homer's Iliad is one of the first great war stories. It's the first great war story of Western, of European civilization. 
and it is the Greeks laying siege to Troy. Troy is a city. Uh, it's a Lydian city. It's where Lydia will be. Uh, it's not a Lydian city at the time. It's a Hittite city, I think, or a Hittite aligned city. But the idea is it's not a Greek city. It's in, it's on Asia Minor. And it is a foreign, it's an Asiatic city, as the Greeks would call it. So it's Europe versus Asiatics, Asians. So what the, it's really Mesopotamians and Hittites and those people as opposed to East Asians, people of China, Japan, South Korea, Southeast Asia. Just so that you understand the, the definition of Asiatic is just different for when we talk in the when we use the vernacular of the ancient world um it's a very 19th century world word um but the iliad is the most important homer's two stories the iliad and the odyssey are the two most important stories in greece everybody who's educated is going to read them so he's writing in a way to teach men how to be men and even if he's if he, even homer didn't mean to do that that's what men reading it did they use it as a handbook of how to be a man so what did homer's iliad teach them and the first is war is what men do but it's not natural there's a scene where one character says war turns uh life upside down in life sons bury fathers but in war fathers bury sons and then there's a very famous scene where hector goes to his wife um, I have to go to war. She begs him not to go. And he says, honey, I have to go. I'm the leader of men. If I don't go, who else would go? Who else would ever follow me? I have to go. It's what, it's, it's the man you married. I wouldn't be the man you married if I didn't go and fight. And she's like, but Achilles is going to kill you. I've had the dream. I've seen it. He's going to kill you. If you go and fight him, he will kill you, and I will have no one left. My brothers are all dead. I will have no one left. And Hector goes, I'm sorry, but I'm a leader of men. It's what I have to do. Hector also goes to his son. He goes to pick up his son after he talks to his wife and says, I have to go. He goes to pick up his son. Now, Hector is the hero of Troy. He's the manliest man in Troy, which is why I hated the movie Troy, how they represent him, because he is he's the hero of the Iliad in a lot of ways, because he's the most honorable of all the characters. And he's wearing his helmet, his horse plumed helmet, right, because he's wearing this giant gaudy thing so that people can see him on the battlefield. He's wearing this giant helmet with this plume on it. So that men, when they see, they go, oh, Hector is fighting. I can see him fight. I will fight too. Right? It's like the, the captain's armband or the big C captains wear on the ice. Right? Or the captain's armband in football and soccer. You know, the idea is that it, it distinguishes him from everybody else. And he's wearing his armor. He's wearing his horse-plumed helmet. And he goes to pick up his son. And his son, seeing his father dressed for war, hides, runs to the nurse. He is scared of his father. And now Hector and his wife laugh. and like, ah, oh, children, ha, 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 ha. But what Homer is telling you is, war is not natural. Children are not attracted to war. If war was natural, instead of just a thing, a responsibility, the son would go and grab Hector, He'd put on the helmet himself and be like, oh, son, one day you, that, that helmet will fit you. You know, you will wear my helmet in battle. You know, that's not what happens. The son hides and the father has to get him. And then Hector gives one of the great speeches in all of literature, which is the truism of all fathers or any good father, I would guess, which is, May my son be better than me. May he live a better life. May he be more famous. May he be more respected. May he outdo me. Which is what all fathers are supposed to want for their sons, to be better than them. It's the craven. 
It's the sad. It's the bad father who looks at his son and says, no, I want you to be worse than me. I am better than you. So it's teaching people how to be fathers, but it's teaching that war is what a young man do. It's what young men do, but it's not natural. It's not a natural state of affairs. There's nothing natural in war. Two, the second thing Homer's teaching young men is that cleverness is better than strength. And that's famously in the Trojan horse. Cleverness is better than strength. For 10 years, the Greeks tried to tear down the walls of Troy. They never got close. They never came within an inch of doing it. They were a complete and utter failure after 10 years. How did they capture Troy? Cleverness, a ruse, a trick, the Trojan horse. They gave a gift, which is the Roman, which goes to the Roman uh, quote, beware Greeks giving gifts. The Greeks give the give the Greeks give a giant horse. Odysseus has the idea to give a giant horse, and inside of that giant horse is not caramel, is not taffy, it's death. It's the worst gift ever. It's a gift of death. But the only way to take Troy was not to batter your head against the wall, to not go straight ahead, but to figure a way around, to use your enemy's weaknesses against them. Not to overcome them, but to go around them, to think around the problem. Finally, there are rules to war, and if you break them, the gods get revenge. And this is the death of Achilles. Achilles fights Hector in man-on-man war, man-on-man fighting. Achilles kind of cheats because he's all emotional. He's overly emotional, and he kills Hector. But then he t- then that's probably okay. But then he takes a Hector's body and ties it to his chariot and drives the chariot around Troy, which is this major city, this major port city, and drives it around Troy. I don't know how many times, three times, five times. But he ties it to his chariot, which means he's dragging this body at 20 miles an hour over sand, over gravel, over... There's nothing left of Hector's body by the end of this. Which is why I kind of hated, again, the, the movie Troy, because they show this scene, and then Achilles, as Brad Pitt, shows up at the Greek port, and all the Greeks come out to cheer him. It's like, no, 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 no. They ran away from him. They don't want anything to be near him. Why? Because the gods are up there. Apollo is up there fuming. Apollo is Hector's homeboy of the gods, and he's there going, I am going to kill him. I am going to kill him. I am going to kill that Achilles. I am going to get him. And that's what he does. He gets, during the siege, during the, the, the devastation of uh, the sacking of Troy, Apollo shows up to Paris and says, shoot an arrow. And Paris is like, what do I aim at? He's like, just shoot it. All right, I'll just shoot it. Bing! Apollo takes that arrow and he magically home, it becomes the greatest home heat seeking arrow of all time. And it goes through people, it goes up and down and around, and people it goes through and around, and it boom hits Achilles. Where? In the one place he doesn't have armor, in his heel. And Achilles falls, and some no name guy comes by and stabs him right through the back. Now, none of this is in Homer. This is told in later stories. They pick it up. None of this is in Homer. Homer ends it with Achilles talking to Hector's father, who has shown up to try to get Hector's body back and in disguise. And Achilles realizing, well, one day I'm going to be murdered. If I, if I keep fighting like this, one day I'm going to be killed, and my father's going to have to beg for my body back. Well, that's going to happen in like exactly two more days, three more days. After the, after the end of the Iliad, he's going to have a nameless death, not a glorious one. He's going to die with his face in the mud, and Apollo gets his revenge. The gods will get your revenge if you break the rules of war. There, you're allowed to fight. You're allowed to fight hard. You're allowed to fight viciously. 
but there's still rules and you have to honor those rules. The gods will get revenge if you don't. What did Homer's Odyssey teach men? Well, Homer's Odyssey, he went by the name of Homer. Homer's Odyssey, I love the, the Simpsons Odyssey uh, episode, is that you have to be worthy of other people's loyalty. The thesis of the Odyssey is loyalty. Everybody's doing something out of loyalty. All the good people are doing something out of loyalty. There's the, the biggest theme is a good wife for her husband. That's Penelope. That's Penny. Penelope, P-E-N-E-L-O-P-E, -E -E, doesn't take a husband or a lover for 20 years. Now, she's queen of Ithaca, and for the first 10 years, it would look bad if she took a lover, much less another husband. Her husband's at war, and she's waiting. And everybody kind of understands that. And only the most craven of guys would have even approached Pen Penny and been like, hey, while your husband's away, let's play. Like, your dad's hoping something bad happens to the king. Like, most guys stay away. But that second 10 years, the war is over and Odysseus is lost and presumed dead. Not only should Penelope take a husband, She's supposed to take a husband. She's supposed to. The, the kingdom needs a king. Her son is too young to be king, so the kingdom needs a king. And she doesn't. And not only does she not, as the young men start showing up and they start hanging out and they start, you know, trying to seduce Penelope, they start you know, hey, hooking up with her servant girls. They start, you know, doing, eating her out of house and home, right? They start making agreements among themselves with the men, these young men realize is it doesn't matter which one of them marries Penelope because they'll just make agreements with each other that they'll all help each other out. You know, they're all these craven guys. And meanwhile, Penelope is trying every way she can to not take another husband. She doesn't know Odysseus is alive. She has no idea. But she's doing it out of loyalty to her husband in case he is alive. This is given as the opposite of Clytemestra. Clytemestra, who is going to show up in, in um, not in the Odyssey, but in plays, is Agamemnon's wife. Agamemnon's trophy wife, to be honest. Uh, Agamemnon is the king of the Greeks. Technically, quote unquote, he's the leader of the army at Troy, the Greek army at Troy. He's technically in charge, but nobody likes him. He's got hubris up the wazoo. And to get to Troy earlier, he murders, he sacrifices several of his children by Clytemestra. Because they're not real children, they're trophy, children. They're trophy wife children. And I got to get a better wind. So I got to get to Troy earlier. Now, it didn't matter that he got to Troy earlier because it's going to take 10 years to take Troy. It, it didn't matter. He sacrificed those children for literally nothing. Well, what the plays tell us is that Agamemnon is barely over the horizon before Clytemestra starts taking another lover. And she's not doing it out of selfishness. She's not doing it for herself. She's doing it to find a person who's willing, who's capable, who's man enough to murder Agamemnon if the Trojans don't do it. And she finds a guy. She uses her sexuality to seduce men and then says, all you have to, you can have this, you can marry me. All you have to do is murder Agamemnon. Then you could be king, I could still be queen, and you can get all the loving you want. And of course, she finds some young boy who's like, oh, yeah, I could do that. All I have to do is kill the old guy. Easy. And Agamemnon comes home, and he's home 15 minutes, and he says, I have conquered Troy. I'm the greatest Greek king ever. And Clymester says, great, let's have sex. And Agamemnon says, great, uh, sure, no problem. Uh, that's fast. Okay. She, Clymester says, take off your armor. He goes, that's true. I got to take off my armor. He takes off his armor. And she goes to embrace him, and she stabs him in the gut. 
and then the young lover comes out from behind a door and stabs him in the back, which is where we get the phrase stabbed in the back from, and then they push him out a window and defenestrate him. And Agamemnon, king of the Greeks, the feeder of Troy, got to enjoy his victory for all of about 15 minutes. Why? Because, unlike Odysseus, he was not good to his wife. Meanwhile, Penelope is doing everything, going beyond what she has to do. She has every right to take a new husband, and she won't. Clytemestra can't wait to kill her husband. So what does it teach us? Be worthy of your wife. Be worthy of the loyalty of your good wife. Two, be worthy of the loyalty of a son. A son for the memory of his father. Telemachus is Odysseus' dad. Telemachus is a, is a single, is raised by a single parent. He's like a couple months old when Odysseus leaves. Or a couple years old. He's, he's, he's a baby when Odysseus leaves. So he's basically run, he's basically raised by a single mother. He doesn't know who his dad is. All he knows is a story that his mom tells about his dad, which of course are biased, right? She's not going to say, oh, your father is a terrible person. So Telemachus has his own odyssey, helped by Athena, who's, if Apollo is, is Hector's homeboy, Athena is Odysseus's homegirl in, the, in Mount Olympus. And he goes to meet all his dad's homeboys. He goes and, and, and meets, and this is kind of where we learn about what happened to Agamemnon. Uh, he goes and meets Nestor. And he shows up, and he's a young guy, and Nestor's old, and he's cranky. He's like, why? Why is this kid here? Who's this kid? And he goes, please, sir, I'm Odysseus's son, and he hasn't come home. Can you tell me about him? I don't know who he is. And suddenly Nestor's like 20 years younger. Get him some meat. Get him some wine. Oh, let me tell you about your old man. Let me tell you about your dad. And this is where we learn about the Trojan horse. We learn about the Trojan horse in flashback. We don't, Homer doesn't tell us about the fall of Troy. We have to wait for Virgil to do that. But we hear about that Odysseus came up with the idea here in telling Telemachus, what his old man was like, what his father was like. Why? Because Telemachus thinks, Telemachus believes that his, if his father is a great man, he has to live up to that greatness. But if his father is a coward, he has to be better than his father. He has to be better than the memory of his father. He has to know. He doesn't know who his father is. And the only people who know who his father is is his friends, is his homeboys. Because all Telemachus could ever know, any son or daughter can know about their father, is them as a father. They don't know about them as a best friend. They don't know about them as a war buddy. They don't know about them as a drinking buddy. They don't know them in any other way than as a dad, if they're successful or failure as a dad. So he wants to know, so he goes to his father's friends and says, what was my dad like? I want to know who my father is. And finally, the third is, and there's more, but the third big one is a dog for his owner. Odysseus's dog, Argos, is famous for his strength, famous for his hunting skills. And Odysseus leaves him. He leaves Argos and says, you can't come with me. I'm going to war. War is what men do, and dogs, good dogs, have to stay leaves and he goes to war and after the war he tries to get home and he goes on all these adventures most of which he doesn't want to do and it's another 10 years and meanwhile Argos waits and Argos waits and Argos loyally waits to see his owner his master his 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 human home just like Penelope is waiting and the dog is badly treated. The dog is kicked out of the house by those young, those young studs who want to replace Odysseus. And he's thrown, he's flea bitten, and he's he's thrown onto 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 um, animal dung and feces, and he's thrown into a barn, and he's he's treated badly. And he stays alive, and he waits, and he waits, getting older and older. 
Odysseus returns. Spoiler, but Odysseus returns. But he does not return as Odysseus. He returns as an old man because Athena knows, Athena shows him as an old, makes him into an old man because Athena knows that if he shows up as Odysseus, the young lovers are going to murder him. They, you know, just like they do to Agamemnon, they, they will turn on him as a group and murder him, right? So he has to show up in disguise. And there's a famous scene. He's walking up to the gates. He's walking up to the mead hall to go for the final encounter. And he sees his dog. He sees Argo still alive. Argos is 25. Argos is 30 years old. Argos is so ancient that he's probably older than most of the guys who wanted, who's been trying to usurp Odysseus and trying to get with Penelope. He's that old. You can imagine what that is for a dog. And Argos sees him. And Argos sees through the disguise because Argos can also smell him and knows this is Odysseus. And the, ta the tail wags and, and he barks and he's happy and he sees. And Odysseus cannot react because if Odysseus reacts, it will give away his disguise. And Odysseus has to see this dog who has waited for him to come home and not do anything, not react, except he cries, a tear. Now, this is a man who has fought war for 10 years. This is a man who has defeated Troy. This is a man who has seen all of his men killed by in horrible ways, by giants, by nature, by the gods. This is a man who has had nothing. He has had everything but his skin taken from him. And he sees this dog who has loyally stayed alive just to see him. And he cannot pet him. He cannot hold him. He cannot in any way react. And he goes into the meat hall for the final encounter. And Argos dies right there. Happy. Because Argos has seen his owner Argos has seen his human home at last. What the Odyssey is trying to teach men is to be worthy of that kind of loyalty, of that kind of love, to be worthy of that. Because most of us aren't. We're just not. We're flawed people. We're, we we sh have to strive to have a good wife, to have a good son, to have a good dog care that much about us. That even when they should do other things. Lemicus doesn't have to know his father. Why should he care? His father left. Argo sh shouldn't have to stay alive. That's exhausting. His life is not good. He's old. He's toothless. His bones are brittle. He's, he's got maggots on him. It's terrible to be Argos. And Penelope has to live this lonely life with no one to love her, no one to hold her. Hey. Out of loyalty, out of love. And so Homer is telling men, to be worthy of that, like Odysseus is worthy of that. So how did drama teach people culture? Well, the mode was the actor and the chorus, literally an individual and a group on stage, separate. The actor stood on one end of the stage, the group stood on the other end of the stage, and the group represented the group. The chorus represented the group. It represented tradition and society and limitation and responsibility. And what it constantly said is, listen to us, act like us. It will be okay if you listen to us. The individual represented independence, individualism, freedom, represented me. I want to be free. I want to be me. While the group represented us, the we. And so what drama was trying to teach people was, how does an individual live in a democratic world where your individualism must be supplemented, supplemented to the group. 
you can't live as an individual with other people. You have to, you can't go through stop signs. You can't drive through red lights, right? You have to stop so that other people can go. You have to hold the door for old ladies. Why? It's slowing you up, but you do it. Why? Because it's the proper thing to do. So you're giving up a right for you to go as fast as you can, to, for you to get stuff done on your time. And you're giving up that for other people. And in, an, in a democratic society that says, you are important, the individual is important, well, how do you tell the individual that they're not the most important thing in the whole wide world? How do you tell them? How do you show them? How do they learn that they have to give up some of those rights on an everyday basis so that the group does better? That's what drama is trying to do. It's doing it through plays. It's doing it through the theater by literally having the actor and the chorus telling two different stories. The actor is saying me. The chorus is saying we and us. So what method did drama use to teach people? That tragedy. They used tragedy because of hubris. Now, hubris is defined as pride, but it's not really pride. That's a, because Christianity took pride and they made it into a bad word. But if you're like, kid does well in school, like you feel pride about that. When your daughter gets married, you're going to feel pride about that. You know, and that's not a bad thing. And so hubris is violent self-love. It is where you say, it is Gaston, where you say, I am great, so I deserve to be treated like I'm great. It's the deserve that's the important thing. Gaston is the most important guy in town in Beauty and the Beast. He is awesome. They sing a four-minute long song about how awesome he is. But he says this in the beginning. I'm going to marry the most beautiful girl in town. And that makes her the best. And don't I deserve the best? It doesn't matter what Belle wants. It doesn't matter what the town folk wants. Gaston says, I'm the best person in town. I deserve the best. And so that's hubris. That is the tragic flaw that will lead to the destruction of the hero and everybody else. And what happens at the end of Beauty and the Beast? Gaston is killed because he goes to fight a war against the beast using the townsfolk, many of whom get hurt, some of whom get killed. He goes and stabs the beast. He falls to his death. If he didn't do that, if he married one of, one of or all of the triplets, he'd live a very nice life, being great, being the most famous guy in town. He doesn't. He lets his hubris just eat at him that he has to have Bell, that nobody else will have Bell, and it leads to his destruction. So how is this done? It's done through two concepts uh, explained by Aristotle. Peripatia and anonorisis. Peripatia is the reversal of fortune. It is the moment when things start going badly. It is Romeo and Juliet where Mercutio gets stabbed. And he, Mercutio looks and he knows he's dying. He knows he's going to die. And he declares a plague on both your houses. You have made worms meet of me. A plague, a plague on both your houses. It is the moment where Romeo and Juliet goes from being a nice romance, it's kind of a little creepy, but it's a, it could be a comedy. It could end as both families get together and everybody's happy. From Mercutio's death, everything's going to go bad because Romeo is going to kill Tybalt. Tybalt's family, the Capulets, are going to demand vengeance. Romeo is going to have to flee the city. Um, the father... Capulet is going to demand Juliet marry Paris. And because he demands Juliet marries Paris, he doesn't know that Juliet has already married Romeo. And that would make her a polygamist, which would, which would damn her soul. So she divides, she decides, I'm going to kill myself, but I'm not really going to kill myself. I'm going to pretend to kill myself. But Romeo doesn't know that. So Romeo finds out that she's dead. So he kills himself. And it's, it's just everything goes badly from the moment Mercutio is killed. The second is anonorisis, the realization. It is the moment where you realize 
everything, the truth of one's nature, the truth of the situation. It is Empire Strikes Back. It is it is Luke Skywalker fighting Darth Vader. And Luke has been fighting Darth Vader for two movies. Darth Vader who killed his father. And he says, no, no, I will never work for you. And Darth Vader says, come, we will rule the, we will rule the galaxy. No, I will never work for you. You killed my father. And Darth Vader then drops the hammer. I am your father. And Luke goes, no, he'll search your feelings. You know it to be true. And that's when, that's the anonorisis, when Luke lets out this guttural, no, that his greatest enemy in the universe is the man he has missed his entire life. The man who he's wanted to know his entire life. The man who he's loved and respected his entire life, despite having never really met him. That's anonorisis. It is the realization. It is where Oedipus realizes that he has murdered his father in cold blood and the woman he has married and had children with is his mother. He didn't know that. The man he murdered was a stranger. The woman he married was a hot queen who was into him. And it turns out to be a disaster. Okay. And that's what we learned to not be full of yourself, even when you're awesome, to be worthy of people's loyalty, to be an individual, but sublimate that individuality to the greater good, and to be clever, to be honorable, to be strong of personality. That's what Greek culture is telling us. In our next episode, we're going to talk about uh, warfare, and the Persian Wars, the Peloponnesian Wars, and Alexander. Take care. Thank you.